Hi, everyone. This is Stephanie Ripper. Thank you for tuning in to the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we rethink, reinvent, and gain a deeper understanding of the stuff that matters most. Now, today is episode seven. And in this episode, I have on Professor Stuart Firestein, who has radically disrupted the way that we think about science. Now, I don't quite remember when I encountered Professor Firestein's work. I was immediately drawn to it, however. It has been a significant part of my project here at Oxford to try to understand not just humans, but our major institutions like religion and politics and government and science, especially, try to understand them in new ways. As science is often thought of as this huge monolithic fact generating machine, right? Science is full of discovery and certainty and increasing our technological power and prowess and vast store of knowledge. But that's that's A, an oversimplification, and B, uh, really aggrandizing and not at all truthful to how science actually proceeds. Uh, not at all truthful to what science is like over the course of not just a day in the lab, but also over the span of hundreds, if not thousands of years as the practices and ideas and evolve and the paradigms shift. So what uh, Professor Firestein does is radically, you know, just says, hey, look, he's got a book. It's called Ignorance. I have a copy um, with me. I have copies of books by most, most people we have on. Um, and it's about ignorance and how important the concept of ignorance is to science. And it's important. It's just really important for how we, how we move forward, understanding science better and relating to it better. And hopefully uh, not just like a in some parts of society, taking it down maybe a few notches, and then in other parts of society, helping people value it, understand it, and relate to it better. So um, a little bit about uh, Professor Firestein before we get started. Um, you know, I like to read you uh, a little bit about what they've accomplished. He's accomplished a lot, so it's, it's, it's a long one. Here we go. Dr. Stuart Firestein is the former chair of Columbia University's Department of Biological Sciences, where his laboratory studies the vertebrae olfactory system, possibly the best chemical detector on the face of the planet. This is true. Aside from its molecular detection capabilities, the olfactory system serves as a model for investigating general principles and mechanisms of signaling and perception in the brain. His laboratory seeks to answer the fundamental human question, how do I smell? Dedicated to promoting the accessibility of science to a public audience, Firestein serves as an advisor for the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's program for the public understanding of science. Recently, he was awarded the 2011 Lenfest Distinguished Columbia Faculty Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Teaching. He is a fellow of the AAAS, the American Academy Association of the Sciences, an Alfred Sloan Fellow and a Guggenheim Fellow. At Columbia, he is on the advisory board of the Center for Science and Society and the Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience, both centers for interdisciplinary work between the sciences and the humanities. Brilliant. Perfect. His book on the workings of science for a general audience called Ignorance, How It Drives Science, was released by Oxford University Press in 2012. His new book, Failure, Why Science is So Successful, appeared in October 2015. They have been translated into 10 languages. So quickly, uh, as ever, I'll talk about me as briefly as I can before we uh, bring on the brilliant doctor professor. So uh, a few things. You can consume this podcast in a number of different ways. And I just want everybody to be aware of all of the ways. Uh, the biggest platforms, of course, were on Apple iTunes and Stitcher and um, Android apps and Spotify and all the places that you might try to find a podcast. I am also hosting these on YouTube. So uh, for those of you who like to look at a face while you're getting some information or you're just listening, live streaming while you're online, you're more than welcome to pop in on YouTube and, and take a look. Um, I do a lot of nodding and smiling, uh, but also it's, it's really nice to be able to uh, see the guests animated. So uh, I really like that. 
the iTunes platforms, you know, would be great. Subscribe to both. That would do me a huge favor, uh, but I will refrain from begging for your help for a few episodes just uh, just so you can get to know me a little bit better before. So there's that. Um, also, you can find show notes where I link to all these different things at stephanierupert.com. I don't, I, you can read my name in the, in the show description to figure out how to spell it, stephanierupert.com and then slash the episode number. So this will be stephanierupert.com slash seven. I'll link to things that we talk about in the episode and uh, the book giveaways and the like the book giveaway I've talked about in every episode. So hopefully you're tired of it by now, but not so tired that it's annoying. The book giveaway, I am giving away copies of books that I really, really like. You can find out which books are on that list, stephanierupert.com slash book giveaway. I'll go to the show notes. You can find it there. And um, I, I do this for people who leave reviews of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, whatever, um, as a gesture of gratitude. And of, and of course, it incentivizes you to help me. And then I try to help you by giving you a free book. I like reciprocity. So uh, take a screenshot or a review, email it to tmoeverything at gmail.com, and then it should be uh, then you'll be entered. I will begin telling you, uh, I will begin announcing winners as soon as there, I have made these videos live, which I haven't yet actually. So uh, that'll start happening uh, in a handful of episodes. But if you get in now, uh, you will be getting into the drawing now and you'll be in it forever. So um, please do that. It'd be a great help. Um, and that's, that's it for us, for our notes. After this, I will uh, record a short episode where I talk, elaborate a little bit more on uh, my opinions about, about science and what it is in our society. And I'm, I'm really excited to do it. I will also, of course, always be answering your questions or addressing things that have come up, not just per se about this episode, but say on Instagram, if there's a conversation going on or what have you. On the Instagram, you can find me at Stephanie Rupert, same thing on Facebook. I'm everywhere. Okay, great. Thank you for your patience. Now, uh, here I will bring on the professor. And uh, welcome, Stuart. Hi, thank you for coming. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. I've actually been really looking, uh, really looking forward to this uh, as we were just, uh, Stuart and I were just chatting before I turned on the camera. Uh, Reimagining science is, I think, one of our most important. Uh, cultural tasks. And so I, I'm really, really grateful for what you do. All right. Well, let's re reimagine it. I'm all for that. <laughs> Could use a little reimagining. Yeah. A little touch up here and there, I'm sure. Definitely. I mean, yes. And, and again, thank you so much for that. So, um, so you, have, you have two books out and they're Ignorance and Failure. And kind of a market um, cornering, as it were, here. <laughs> A little niche, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's not a lot of competition because no, you know. a lot of people just like to, you know, yes, just to go with the go with the cultural assumptions about what science is. But um, but you're what you're doing is saying, well, hang on, you know, we're we're sort of missing some pieces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe uh, I introduced your work a little bit earlier, but I. Could you tell us a little bit in your own words, like, obviously you are first, you are a scientist and you have right. been for decades um, and the work that, yeah. <laughs> that bad. Huh? Pretty, okay. it's, it's on your CV. You know, okay, I read your okay. CV. Um, so uh, you've been a scientist for, for decades. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your relationship with science and how you came to this realization about the importance of ignorance in your work and then like how it, it developed into this advocacy that you're doing. Sure. Well, maybe I'll just preface this very quickly by saying that I think um, almost anything I'm going to wind up saying today, most people sort of will already know, I think. I don't think there's anything new about what I'm saying. The, the difference is that I think we all know it implicitly. I mean, we all know that science is about the unknown and things like that, right? So, the, so that's almost trivial sounding because we know that implicitly. But I think the value comes in taking some of these things that we have known implicitly for a long time and making them explicit because you see new things in them that you don't really realize you thought about when you said, oh, yeah, sure, science is about ignorance. So, and failure, the same thing. I think it, it's a question of making them explicit. So. So I came to this really in, in a kind of 
dual role that I have here at, at Columbia, where I'm a scientist, as you say, and I run a laboratory. We study the sense of smell as a part of the brain, trying to understand things about the sense of smell that will also relate to how the brain works. I'm fond of saying that we're where my laboratory is involved in answering that fundamental human question, how do I smell? And all the possible angles of that, I suppose. So, um, and, and it's, it's quite interesting, of course. It's a great life. I'm, I'm really thrilled and, and uh, to, to be able to live this way. I feel very, um, uh, well, you know, blessed in a way that I am able to come in every day and work with young people, graduate students and postdocs. And we sit around and we think of experiments and we try and do creative things and all the rest of that. And it's quite exhilarating. And I, I also uh, teach a course here. I have teaching responsibility. So I teach an uh, undergraduate class in neurobiology, neurobiology, cell and molecular neurobiology. It's a dreadful sounding name and almost as dreadful a course, I'm sure. But it's a, it's a big biology course, a big course on the brain. It's like 23 fact-filled lectures. We use this big, very big book called Principles of Neuroscience um, by three eminent neuroscientists. And I learned that, well, I know the book has 1,414 pages. I looked up at one point what it weighs for shipping weight, and it's seven and a half pounds. Okay. Just to put that in some perspective, seven and a half pounds is more than twice the weight of a human brain. It's a book on neuroscience. It's a book on the brain. It weighs twice as much as a brain. So, so it's not uninteresting putting a course like this together. You know, I mean, it's, it's organizing it and getting everything set up and all that. But I also realized it's not exactly exhilarating either. Um, to just talk about the stuff we know, to talk about the facts. And I thought, well, this is not really what science is about anyway. And I don't care how many pages there are in that book. I don't want to give the impression that we really know how the brain works. Just because we have seven and a half pounds of book to tell us this, we really know squat for the most part. And that's the interesting part of it, isn't it? Mm. So, so I, I, thought, why not teach a class in what we don't know for a change, just to see what happens. So it's a sort of an experiment. I started this class called Ignorance. And um, as you might imagine, a place like Columbia University or something, you know, students see a class listed called Ignorance, they think, oh, I'll take that, you know, <laughs> this is how I'll spend the family money. Why not? So I remember professors like you. We had a course, uh, I, I did my undergrad at Dartmouth, and it was called Harry Potter, and everybody wanted to take it, but it ended up being like intense literary theory. <laughs> And everybody hated it. <laughs> That's cheating. That's cheating. This is, this is not that. This really is about ignorance, except, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's an easy A, trust me. Although I often say to students, they, you know, of course, the students always want to know about how we're going to grade the class and all that. And I often say to them, um, you know, I think you should think about this. I mean, because there'll be an essay or something like that. But you want to think about the grade you want because your transcript is going to read ignorance. Do you want an A? <laughs> On an F, I don't know what, what you think the right grade for this is. That always puzzles them a bit. <laughs> but the, the class basically is, I mean, aside from some readings that we do and discussions and things like that, the, the real meat of the class is that I invite members of the science faculty mostly. Lately, I've inv invited some humanities people. But in the first couple of years, members of the science faculty here at Columbia or in New York or people coming through to... Um, to come in and sit down with students for two hours, usually in an evening from like 6 to 8 p.m., and talk to them about what they don't know. And um, that's what we do. And so I often, you know, a professor will say to me, well, how do you want me to prepare? And I say, no, no, no preparation, no PowerPoint, no lecture. You are prepared. Just come here the way you would walk into your lab in the morning. And that's what we'll do. And you and I will have a discussion about the questions that interest you and the students will join in, which they do. And that's what we talk about. So why this question versus that question? How did you become interested in this question? How long has this been a question? How many ancillary questions are there with it? Why do you choose one question over another? What happens if you answer it? Don't answer it, all those sorts of things. And then we wander off on a lot of tangents and try and keep the discussion to what the big questions really are or the little questions, mm -hmm. which are infinitely more interesting than all the facts, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, that's actually something that I found really interesting and important about your book is that that's where like real curiosity and real like that's where our attention should be directed is towards what we don't know as opposed to what we do know. Right. And so 
I mean, listen, you do need to know some things, right? I mean, you can't, uh, so, and of course, I don't, I don't mean the sort of common, more pejorative uh, definitions of ignorance, like stupidity or a callous indifference to fact or reason or things like that. I, I mean a kind of a reasoned ignorance. I mean the kind of ignorance that comes from knowledge, the kind of ignorance that really only experts can possess at the highest level. So it seems to me the more you know, then the better the ignorance you can possess. And that's the trick is, of course, that you don't, you don't want just any old ignorance. You want high quality ignorance, not the low yeah. quality crap that's all over the place, right? Yeah. And so, and so that's the question, really. That's what we argue about all the time. As scientists, you know, the quality of the ignorance. And sometimes those are just bull sessions at the bar. And sometimes they're grant proposals. Sometimes, as I'm fond of saying, it's not so easy to tell them apart, you know, but, yeah. but, but that's really what it is. I mean, it's, the question is not, the question is, sure, you get knowledge. Knowledge is valuable. It's good to know things. But what do you do with that knowledge? What's the main thing you want to do with that knowledge? My feeling is the main thing you want to do with it is use it to pose a better, more sophisticated, more interesting, deeper question. That's the best thing you can do with knowledge. You can do other things with it too, but certainly mm -hmm. the best thing you can do with it is make a better question. Yeah, that's it's sort of a, an illusion we have that once you acquire knowledge, you're sort of eating away at the unknown and eventually you're just gonna like end at final complete knowing once we like like a Pac-Man, you know, chew away all, yes. the, all the pieces of, of unknowing. But what something that you like to say is whenever you learn something, you actually open up more questions. That's correct. If right? it's a good thing, if it's a good thing, I think there's a great line from E.E. E. Cummings and E.E. Cummings poem. I'll get it a slightly wrong here probably, but it's, I think he says always the more beautiful answer that asks the more beautiful question. So that's really nice. Yes. Yeah. It, that's close. Anyway, I, I may have a word messed up in there, but okay. um and yes, I think that's exactly the, the case, right? I mean, that's what you really want to do. The last thing you want to do is actually come to a dead end, come mm -hmm. to a, quote, conclusion, and be done with it. Then, then what am I going to do? You know, what am I out of a job at that point? I don't know. I, uh, who wants that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there is no, you know, with science, it's not like a, there's a common image of science that we're, you know, piecing together some big puzzle that scientists are taking little pieces here and there and fitting them into this big puzzle. But I don't think that's really accurate because, first of all, with the puzzle, the manufacturer has guaranteed that there's a solution, right? Assuming all the pieces are there. Whereas I think in science, that's not the case. We have no guarantee that there is an ultimate answer here or that there is and this is a very freighted word, a final solution. <laughs> Do we want a final solution? You know where that goes. That's never been a good idea, it seems to me. And so that's one of the great things about science is it seems like an unending set of questions. Even if there is an ultimate answer, how close are we to ultimate, really? Mm -hmm. We're nowhere near it. So why act like there is, you know? No. Uh, do you think that it's out there someday? Well, I, I guess, I mean, what is it? The number 42 or something, you know, from the <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide? Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, it could come down to that. At some, some point, we may just, you know, go slap our head and go, oh, my God, I can't believe it was that easy, right? It was that simple? That's the whole answer. Mm. I, I mean, I, I don't know whether there is or not. But as I say, I think it doesn't really make any difference as to how we operate now, how we think about science, how we think about the world. It's still mostly mysterious. And it seems like the more we know about it, the more mysterious the damn thing gets. I mean, we don't, you know. So science went through this long period, especially in biology, of a kind of reductionist mode. You know, we, let's get down to cells, then let's get down to molecules and genes or this or that. And, but, but at every level of reductionism, things don't get simpler. They get, it seems more complicated. So that looks like the way it's going to be. I think that's true in physics too, you know. Mm. Starts out with big planets running around each other. Okay, you can figure those equations out. But then little by little, you get down to molecules and atoms and electron clouds and quantum this and that. Then it just gets more and more complicated the, the more reductionist you get. Right. Okay. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm curious, what is your opinion on like theories of everything? You know, will there uh, be a unified theory of everything? Um, I think it's worth the hunt. I mean, I think the idea of a unified theory of everything is what is a great motivating idea, I guess, for physicists. I mean, I'm not a physicist, and only physicists seem to have the notion that there has to be a theory of everything. I mean, biologists revel in, 
in variety. We revel in diversity, right? We like the fact that everything seems to be different in a myriad kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So for us, no, theory of everything beyond evolution, let's say, which is the closest thing I think biologists will ever come to, to a theory of everything, um, doesn't really mean as much to us. But for physicists, if that's what keeps them going, fine. <laughs> Let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's actually really interesting because if you look at them, um, there have been studies done on the like religiosity of, you know, various types of scientists yeah. and across the board, it's pretty low. But once you get over to theoretical and theoretical physics and math, it shoots way up, you know? Yeah, I, I can, I can understand that. I mean, I, I, I suspect that, you know, that that's this, um, I guess the physicists, the mathematicians have become famous for this, uh, what are they called? The anthropologists? Anthropic principle. Yeah. That, yeah, you know, although it's flawed. The, the various constants of nature, the weight of the electron and this and that, right? Yeah, these these funny little numbers that seem to come from nowhere, but if you change them by, you know, a hundredth of a decimal point, the whole place would just go up and would become a big black hole or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you some feeling that, well, this had to be organized somehow or another, you know. Of course it doesn't. I mean, that's the that's the same fallacy as the argument from design, you know, you look backwards on anything, it looks designed, but that doesn't right. mean that's the way it had to be to get that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think there's like this, in, in those fields, a real attachment to the idea of unity and beauty and elegance, you know, in your theory. Yes, yes. Some of that comes from, I think, now we're, we're both probably, at least I am talking certainly beyond my level of expertise, but, um, but I think some of that comes from the fact that mathematics in this weird way continues to find brand new applications in physics. So really weird, totally abstract, uh, pure math, which has, you know, according to the mathematicians, no value whatsoever beyond the intellectual one. One thing after another, suddenly physics finds a good use for it or some mm. really intractable problem in physics and some mathematician comes up with some, you know, who knows what theory of this or that. And some physicist says, wow, that would really work for, you know, I mean, it happened with Einstein, really, and Lagrangian things and all the rest, or Hamiltonians, all those things that I barely understand. And so I think that's one of the things that gives them a kind of faith in this, that, you know, there's, uh, there was a paper by a uh, famous physician, uh, physicist, sorry, um, was it Ed Witten, I think? I'm not sure. Who, mm -hmm. uh, the paper was the unreasonable, um, the unreasonable success of mathematics and physics. Interesting. There's no reason to expect that it should work all the time. And yet it, it seems to do so. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's fascinating. You know? um, yep. I'm writing that down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Um, so something uh, I would really like what I'd really like to turn to now is sort of the, the cultural relevance or implications of all of this. Um, because yes, like there is, there is a misunderstanding, but I suppose, um, and we've talked a little bit about how much we like knowledge, you know, how much we like knowledge and how much we like certainty. Why do you think us, maybe it's just us in the West or maybe it's humans generally, but why do you think we're so enamored with this like scientific you know, science as something that brings us answers? Yeah, it's a complicated question, I suppose. So, so one thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm not so entirely clear that we love certainty. Mm. Um, there, there's certainly places where we, we prefer uncertainty. I mean, you don't want to play poker. Well, you might want to know. <laughs> you might <laughs> be playing poker for a significant amount of money, like to know what's in everybody else's hands. But that would kind of ruin the game for everybody, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? And, you know, you go to casinos, you don't, the whole idea is you're playing uncertainty. You, you wouldn't watch a football game or a cricket match, let's say, or a baseball game if you knew the score beforehand. And I don't think any of us wants to know the exact time and date of our death. Um, so in those areas, uncertainty seems to be fine. Now, I will say that I think that kind of uncertainty is different than scientific uncertainty because all of those things will, in fact, come to a resolution. I mean, at some point, the hand is shown, the roulette ball falls into a slot, you know, the game is over and the score is recorded. And unfortunately, there will indeed be a slip of paper somewhere, an entry with the exact time and date of my death on it one of these days. 
Um, so eventually these things all resolve. And I think science, of course, has a kind of a grander uncertainty in that there is no guarantee that mm. it will resolve. But why do we want it to? Is I think sort of the question that you're asking. Why do we seem to have this attraction to it? And again, I'm well, I think the reason we seem to be attracted to it, the reason we harbor these beliefs in science, that it has the truth, that it has unassailable knowledge, that it has facts and things like that, that, that never change is because that's what our education system promotes mm. wrongly in my opinion, but that's what it promotes. So when you, I mean, that's the textbook that I teach from is 1,414 pages of facts, not things that we don't know, big holes in here that they don't bother to point out or maybe say this area still remains to be, you know, mm -hmm. this or that. But for the most part, it's facts that students can memorize and spit back up on a test, you know, and so we can evaluate them in some way or another and give them a grade. But I think the, and that's its own sort of set of problems, of course, but the, maybe the even unintended consequence is that we put into people's heads the idea that science is a bunch of great discoveries made by fabulous geniuses who never had any trouble, who never failed at anything, you know, and it went from, from uh, Copernicus to Galileo to Kepler to Newton, the blah, 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 to Faraday and so forth, all the way up, usually a bunch of men, even though there were a lot of women in there who never get any credit, you know, um, uh, uh, Marie-Anne Lavoisier or um, Herschel's uh, sister, Caroline, people like that. So there are all these people as well who we don't bother with. We just have this heroic narrative of genius guys that, you know, made physics. And that's not clearly the way it happened. You know, there were lots of mistakes along the way, lots of failures, lots of years of not knowing things. I mean, you know, we think it all just happened and happened quickly one on top of another, but sometimes decades passed where no progress seemed to be made at all. But we don't teach any of that. We don't teach that that's the way science happens. Mm -hmm. And so I think even, I mean, even when it comes to college science courses or and I mean college science courses for majors, for people who expect to go into science, they don't get that. They still just get this fact-filled, heroic narrative, this arc of discovery myth about science. It's not until, in my opinion, not until I got into graduate school that I began to find out that, you know, people are more interested in the questions I have than the things that I know, mm. that most of what I do fails, and that that's fine. And, you know, all of those, and the facts are kind of provisional, they're good for the moment, but we hope that they'll be revised, we hope that they'll be better one way or another. So, so this notion of a sort of stable knowledge is really, I think, it's anti-progress. If you think about it carefully, it's anti-progress. If knowledge becomes stable, if you've written it in stone, as it were, well, then you're kind of done with it, right? You're going to just have a pile of stones mm. that can't be moved, and that's no good. So, but. Do we teach science as this dynamic process, as this constant set of inquiries where revision is a victory, as one historian said? I don't think we do. And that's, that's where I believe at least much of this problem comes from. And you mentioned in your book, you mentioned fear of ignorance. Do you think that in addition to having this sort of, you know, these sorts of ideas about knowledge, the flip side of that is that we're afraid of not knowing or we're afraid of questions? Is there something in us that is averse to questions? Well, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, and even if I were, I doubt I would have an answer to that question, <laughs> or at least one that you should believe. But I will, I, I, in a kind of an answer to it, I came upon while writing this book an interesting phrase by the, by the poet John Keats, and he wrote mm -hmm. in a letter to his brother when he coined the term negative capability which seems almost a little oxymoronic, right? This idea okay. of developing negative capability. But he defines that, I'll get this a little bit wrong too, but he defines that as that state of being in mystery, unknown, doubt, and uncertainty without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And he considers this the ideal creative state, specifically mm -hmm. for the literary mind, but I would say for the scientific mind or the scholarly mind or any mind at all. And it's this notion of being patient with ignorance, of abiding by not knowing, of not being upset, not being irritable, if you will, about the ignorance, but actually developing a kind of a capability of wallowing in it, because that's where the creativity comes from. It's from what you don't know. It's from the mystery and the doubt and the uncertainty that creative answers spring. It's not from the, the stuff you can list on a 
piece of paper or recite back to me from a book. What's creative about that? Mm. I think it was William Butler Yeats, I may end. Can't remember whether I have this in ignorance or not, but William Butler Yeats, who talks about education and says that it's not about filling buckets, it's about lighting fires. Mm. It's a big difference, right? But yeah. we fill buckets mostly in education now, I'm afraid. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've done a lot of reading about the impacts of writing as a technology and mm. the differences between written cultures and oral cultures. And it's very fascinating to me that today we have this, this idea that creativity, that lighting fires is, is where intelligence and progress lie. Um, but I think that that's actually relatively new um, to, to the human species. I think uh, at least the people who write about oral cultures think that for the vast majority of human history, we had people had uh, valued knowledge retention and mnemonic devices and stories that helped them hold uh -oh. on to, did you lose me? Yes, just for a minute. It was just the people who believe in oral traditions, oral cultures, are you there? Yes? Yeah, okay. I'm here. Can okay. you, are we still good? Can you hear now me? Now we're good, yes. Okay. And I really um, want to hear this because I have, want to write it down and then I want to talk about it. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, was I saying people who study oral cultures? People who study? Was I talking yes. About okay. Um, yeah, so uh, people who study oral cultures have argued that the, you know, the types of intelligence that we valued as, as a species for most of our existence was uh, knowledge retention, right? Because if you couldn't write things down, you had to remember things. And so it was very valuable to um, have mnemonic devices and tell stories and all that sort of stuff that helped you retain what had been learned by your people for the last, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and so this, all of this, it seems to me like the humanity is, is becoming increasingly uh, juxtaposed, increasingly close to questions as we developed writing and philosophy and then science. You know, these three forces are sort of pushing us towards greater creativity and questions. And now we have smartphones, so we don't need to remember Jack shit you know <laughs> <laughs> yes but but you can still be you can still be smart or seen as smart or intelligent or creative and come up yes. with solutions and it's just it's fascinating to me and i think it does push us as a species to be closer to uncertainty than or you know ignorance than we might have ever really even thought to be yes i uh, i mean what you said a hundred things there that any one of which could be our whole subject that was brilliant i have to say really i think because <laughs> it is very much this notion of progress and and if you want progress then you then you have to accept uncertainty along with it you have to accept failure and you have to accept ignorance that's the nature of progress progress is going into the unknown and i think you're exactly right although we all believe again in this implicit way that progress has been with us that human beings just you know that's what we have a big brain for we're into progress it's been progress since the egyptians or the greeks or whatever and, but that's not really true. The word, the, even the notion of progress, there are many historians that argue that the Greeks had no word for progress that means what it does today. That their notions of progress were very thin and no were what we would call progress today. That they believed in a cyclic world, that the seasons were cyclical, that almost everything happened in a cyclic way, that the circle was the perfect shape. And this notion of a linearity and a continued movement in some ways forward, if you want to define it that way. I mean, that's controversial too, I suppose, what we mean by progress. But still, this notion that, you know, I think my life has been better than my parents was, and I think my children's life will be better than mine. And that has not, I think, been true for much of human history, and still is not true everywhere in the world, where people believe that I should live like my parents did, and my children should live like I do. Mm -hmm. I don't really want, you know, that kind of progress. So, I mean, I find that to be very pessimistic in a view, but nonetheless, I, I think it's true. And, and, but along with progress, then you have to accept things like ignorance and failure because that's how you make progress. Yeah, I am, I am unsure of how I 
of how I think the progress narrative is going. You know, I yes. think we're I think we're at a very interesting time because we, you know, after the Enlightenment and the modern period and throughout the 1800s and moving up to uh, the start of the World Wars, people were like, "Yeah, we're progressing," and then all of a sudden you know, thinkers and everybody all over the world realize that we're still capable of great atrocity. And then coming out of that, we're like, oh, wait, maybe we can get on the progress train again. Yeah. And, um, and that lasted until maybe about 10 years ago in the West, you know, and then, uh, or two years ago, and all of a sudden we're seeing these like fascist regimes popping up all over the place, right? And, yes. and we're sitting with this question again of like, okay, are we capable of change? But I really think that if we're going to be able to progress as a species, then we have to really sit in these spaces of uncertainty and ignorance and be really creative about like how we can be our best selves, right? We have to really get to know who we are as a species. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to, I think, like continually make progressively better worlds because we'll make better technology sure you know but is that gonna be enough to solve the human the problem of of being deeply flawed humans and i i don't i don't think it will sorry i was very tangential <laughs> no well it's no very big question i know philosophers um you still, you're still there. Okay, good. Sorry, we were jumping a little bit there. I mean, philosophers argue about this quite a bit um, and notions of progress, what it means, what, whether political progress is the same as scientific progress and some, what do they share, what don't they share? I mean, can you talk about progress in art? You know, is, is Picasso progress over Michelangelo? That seems sort of silly to say in a way, right? And yet, and yet things develop in art, art accumulates. Um, so, so the, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very tricky subject, but there's also a sense of it in which we can just simply understand that, listen, you could, there are plenty of places in the world that are not really scientific cultures. They may enjoy the technology that pops out of scientific cultures, and that's fine with me if it makes people's lives better or more fun or prettier or whatever it might be, healthier. But, but, but they don't actually have a scientific culture, I would say, and most places in the world don't have a scientific culture, uh, including some pockets of the places we live, by the way. Um, and, and I would say, in general, you and I and most people wouldn't want to live in those places. We might be happy to go vacation there on the beaches or visit them or, or communicate in this way or that way with them and find it interesting and this and that, but we wouldn't actually be able to live there very successfully, mm. I think. Because we're in a culture that, that has a kind of a, a belief in progress, warranted or otherwise, and we should be careful with it, that's true. But we nonetheless have a kind of a, what I would call an optimism about it. Mm. And I think that, to me, that's important. To me, that's worthwhile. I think that's a good idea. I think that's why, you know, I mean, the, I think that's why we also have art. I don't, I don't think you have art and science separately. Um, I think they work together in a culture to make that culture a more optimistic culture. They allow one or another to be there in some mm. ways. So is it a hope that provides a context in which science and art can arise, or is it that science and art can create hope for progress? I, I think it works both ways. I think, they, they, I think, I think science creates optimism and art probably as well. I'm, I'm more equipped to speak about science, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I'm equipped to speak about any of this at all. But um, so I think science generates optimism, but I think it also feeds on it. And so it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very dynamic process. And where it starts, a, there's a kind of a chicken or the egg thing there that doesn't really matter mm. which way it goes. As long as we keep having chickens and eggs, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I there were a lot of very complex opinions, you know, on the, on the relationship between science and progress. And there are people who think that science is inimical to to progress, and and I I don't I don't agree with that for a variety of reasons. But um, definitely, we can take steps back, and um, science 
creates its own problems. Like, so it, is, it creates its own questions, but it also creates problems, right? Like yeah. uh, we can develop automobiles and this is great because we can transport ourselves, you know, but now we also have climate change, right? And so there's another interesting question, which is can someday science eliminate the sort of feedback loop of, of problem creation? You know, will science as it advances into ignorance actually be able to minimize what we might see as like, you know, maybe we, we make these problems out of ignorance. Right. And so. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I, I suppose I, I'm just purely opinion. Of course, I have no idea, but I, I don't think that there's any way that um, science can progress in a, in a problem free way. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that's kind of the nature of the beast. And, and if you want, progress of any sort it's never going to be in a problem free way i mean we now know that we we should not talk about politics but no we should go ahead <laughs> well you could say democracy is politically progressive it's it's a it's progress over you know parties or dictatorships or things of that nature on the other hand it's clear that democracy is not a problem free solution to government as we now see all over the place. Hmm. So, um, so while democracy is progress, it hasn't come without problems. We shouldn't pretend that it's, you know, I mean, I don't really believe in utopias and I don't think utopias are even optimistic. I think they're a kind of pessimism actually, hmm. because that's kind of the end. That's some idea that there's a goal we can reach and somebody knows what it is or we can know what it is and then we reach it and then we're done. And then what do we do with our days? Hmm. Yeah, and uh, and it also, I think utopianism is a reflection of your dissatisfaction with the present. Yes, yes, which which ought not to be. I mean, one can be dissatisfied with it, but if that motivates you in some way or another, but you should also be pretty grateful for the present that we, for the most part, have at the moment compared to, you know, I mean, the richest person on the planet was in England not so long ago. That would have been Queen Victoria. And her life and her quality of life wasn't 10% of yours as a graduate student. <laughs> You're a graduate student, right? Yes. Yeah. So not even 2% not even of your quality of life. And that was the richest person on the face of the planet at, at one moment. But she nonetheless lived in a you know house full of smoky, dirty walls and poor hygiene and all kinds of terrible things going on right there in her house, Queen Victoria's place. You wouldn't want her life. Yeah. And I, I think it's really important for us to remember that because there is, especially in the humanities these days, you know, there's a lot of anti-science discourse. And I know that most of our culture is very like pro-science and it's ridiculous that you have to be either pro or anti-science, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I think it's, I think it's really important to remember. And when we're talking about progress too, you know, there's a lot of people who are, who think that progress is impossible, but um, you're absolutely right that like technologically speaking, you know, we have, we have solved a lot. We've probably solved more problems than we've created, you know, and we've created some huge problems, Yes. but, but that's not necessarily because of science. It's because, you know, we like convenience and, and that's not necessarily. Yes. We're, yeah, we're weak willed, you know, miserable little critters doing the best we can here as it were, but yeah, and, you know, and you put us into a candy store with all this science. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like the, the science matures faster than we do, you know, which is, I would argue maybe yes. why we need more of the humanities, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you there. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that the, that, that the humanities are a crucial part of anybody's education, and in particular, the education of scientists. Yeah. Um, and those who would tell us how to use science or how best to regulate or, or support it or any of those things. Yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely right there. There's a tremendous contribution to be had. I mean, if you, think, if you think the Renaissance was important or the Reformation was important or any of these other major sorts of things, I mean, the various political revolutions, then how can you not believe that the scientific revolution, which has touched almost every corner of everything we do every day in our lives, is not worthy of study and not worthy of thought and analysis? Yeah. So, I mean, to me, the philosophy or the history of science, it's not a question of whether it's of any value to scientists. It's a value to culture. If you think 
art history is valuable, maybe some people don't, but I do, um, then I think, you know, science history is valuable because it's a part of our culture that the culture should know about. Whether scientists care about philosophy of science or not doesn't make any difference to me. I know. I mean, I know I have many friends who are philosophers of science and they worry about, well, do you guys care about what we're doing? And I said, what do you care whether we care about what we're doing? <laughs> Nothing to do with us. The rest of the culture should care about it. And I hope mm -hmm. they do. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. You know, let scientists just do their tinkering. Yeah, yeah. If they want to get interested in, you know, the philosophy of it or the history behind it, all the more power to them and it'd be better. But they don't have to be. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely, I think it's very important for like people, you know, in our, in our culture to, to think about science in this, in this critical way, because, you know, you mentioned in your book, science, sci we not only science is on a very public stage, right? It's very much in debates about yep. um, abortion, about climate change, about <clears throat> everything. And plus science gets a lot of public funding. Yes. And so we really, should understand like what's happening here you know if we're going to make decisions about what to do with our lives and the planet yes un unquestionably and uh, i mean you know i think it's a scandal that the u.s congress for example has i think one scientist among its members mm. one person trained in science among its members i mean that's ridiculous in the most technologically advanced country that the world has ever seen mm. well and i'm i'm guessing the british parliament doesn't do much better or the french parliament or any of the other major Western governments that pour tons of money into science and live in advanced technological cultures, and yet virtually nobody in the driver's seat mm. um, has any real knowledge of this. I, I bet that you could not find one member of our Congress who could define in a reasonable way the word power, and yet they're going to make decisions about energy and climate change. The word energy, of course, they could never define, but that's, that's maybe- Nobody can. <laughs> right. That's right. But just, you know, power would be an, an important concept you'd think to understand. And you mean in the physical sense? In the yeah. Physics oh, sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. So there's political <laughs> power. That's true, too. But I mean the physics of power because that's what we're really talking about. I mean, people say energy, but in my opinion, we're really talking about power. Right? Mm. I mean, there's as much energy in, a, uh, actually, there's a little bit more energy in a lump of coal than there is in a stick of dynamite. But there's a lot more power in a stick of dynamite. And that's kind of what, what you want in the end. That's what, you, that's what does the work for you. Right. So. Yeah. That's, that's a nice analogy. That's, that's a really good way to put it. Um, something that I thought was interesting was, um, it, this is sort of similar. We're talking about the public you know, understanding of sciences. You offer up ignorance and, and failure. Um, ignorance is a way of offering participation in, yep. in, in the sciences to, to people. And I, I think that's really interesting because, you know, I, I've had a guest on this podcast. Her name is Lisa Sedaris, and she's a brilliant um, critic of many things, including um, how science is so often used as a, as, uh, as a tool for generating wonder or like, you know, talking about the evolutionary epic and how grand and wonderful life is and how we should uh -huh. save it. And she says, look, uh, this isn't accessible to everybody. Like not everybody in the world can participate in this like knowledge that you have this body of knowledge, the knowing. And Richard Dawkins is always talking about like how magnificent it is to know. But you're saying actually we can't, people can participate, but it is through the ignorance side of science. Well, I hope so. I mean, I'd like to think this is the case. This is, yes, this is the, the case I'm making because I mean, it is nice to know things, but there's in the end only so much you can know, and there's only so much you can really be expert in. I mean, I really don't know much more about physics than the average bloke on the street. You know, I'm a pretty good biologist. Even there's a lot of areas of biology I'm not that so, you know, competent in. I'm a good neurobiologist. And even there, you know, there are areas of neurobiology that remain a bit mysterious or obscure to me. And so there are limits to what one can know. And, um, but there's, of course, almost no limit to what you can't know, what you don't know. That's one thing. But, but what's generally more interesting, it seems to me, is what are the puzzles that interest you? 
So everybody can be interested in a puzzle. Everybody can kind of understand the question. And in the process of understanding the question, of course, you do gain some knowledge. You can't really get what the question is about if you don't have a little bit of the knowledge of the field as well. But if you concentrate on the question, then you somehow feel relieved of the, of the, um, of the jargon, of the, the, the weighty details, the, what seems like an impregnable mound of facts and things that you just never get through, right? So why try? And so I think ignorance is, is a little bit more open. A, it's more open and, and, a, and accessible, yes, to people. Mm-hmm. And, and, it's, and it's interesting in this class that I run, when I have scientists come in and talk about their questions, these are people who do some fairly high level kinds of science. I mean, I've had physicists and chemists and earth scientists and even mathematicians, as well as various kinds of biologists, statisticians come in, people who do fairly high level work during the day in their laboratories. And yet when they come in and talk about the questions, they're surprisingly accessible, these questions. They're surprisingly mm-hmm. easy to understand why this is a question. I had somebody um, uh, explain, they do a lot of work on water. Everybody goes, water? Well, we know what water is. It's H2O, right? What well, water is. But it turns out water has all these marvelous properties that nobody can understand or explain. Mm-hmm. I mean, why is it that an ice cube, which is solid, when you put it in a glass of water, it floats. Whereas if you put a block of wood of the same solidity into the water, it would sink. That ice cube should sink, but it doesn't. And we don't actually know exactly why it doesn't. I mean, mm. we have some vague ideas, but, right. but it's, the whole structure of water is a vast unknown. Why it slips and slides around itself, you know. I have all sorts of interesting questions that are much more interesting than knowing about water being H2O. What do you do with that? Who cares? <laughs> right. And, and this, this knowledge about what H2O is will obviously inform your pursuit of answers to these questions, but anybody can ask these questions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You could ask the simple question, why water is wet? And people would not be able to answer that question exactly. I mean, a molecule of H2O is not wet. If you had a molecule of H2O, in the palm of your hand right now it would display none of the properties you associate with water i'm sure i have many (laughs) yes (laughs) um but only because you have many does it have anything to do with like being slippery and wet watery yes yes watery and then there's the whole interesting humanity side of water by the way which is it used to be an element right Mm. air earth fire and water was an element Now we have a whole different idea of what an element is. Now we think water is made of elements. Hydrogen and oxygen are elements. But even that's up for grabs. You know, physicists are not so sure that what we should define as an element. So it's just, you know, it's it's like Russian dolls. You just keep on taking it apart and there are more more and more questions. Yeah, which I find delightful. You know, I find answers my whole life. I have found answers very boring, which is actually, actually, it's kind of why I left science. I'm sorry, I completely misunderstood it. But, you yes. know, I, I did my undergrad in, in earth science. Um, and I was, I was titrating an iron solution in the lab. And I was like, man, I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but see that this is exactly what I mean by this is how we teach science and why it's such a wrong way to teach it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I suspect you, you, you could be very well engaged by science, but not by that kind of science. I agree. I wouldn't be engaged by it either. I mean, dreadful. Well, I was ultimately trying to expand the range at which we think the range of temperatures or pressures at which we think life can survive. Uh, um, and so, okay. yeah, so I was, I was looking at a question that I found interesting, but um, I actually, I need to be doing this is, this is better for me um, in part yeah. because I, the que- but in part because the questions are so foregrounded and I get to ask really big ones that we will probably never have answers to. Like, why? Why anything, right? Yeah, yeah. So why questions we don't do much in science. That's true. Yes, and I, and I like the why questions. Yeah, well, so, yeah. so I bowed out of science. But, um, but, but I think you're right that leaning into it can, um, can make it, enjo- you know, it's enjoyable to, to lean into the exploration part of science. And so- yes. Um, I'm actually, yeah, I, I'm going to send this podcast to some people who have some opinions about <laughs> science okay. and see what they think. Um, cause I think this is a really, uh, a really, really important idea and a great one to end on. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to say before we go. Oh, well, only another couple hours worth actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you can't. Oh, come you back got anytime. you dried me out here. You've <laughs> you've emptied me co totally. Um, um, no, this has been a great pleasure. What an interesting conversation. We should have it again. Yes, uh, not this one, of course, but you know another one. Right, not not exact. We'd have to print yeah. transcripts and read them. Um, yeah. So uh, yes, and I'm sure uh, my my audience will be more than happy to have you back. Um, so yeah, um, thank you. If, if people uh, want to find your work, I know I can link to your books on Amazon. Is there anywhere else where they should be? You well, know, following you or something. Uh, the, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't do the social media thing very well. I'm just too much of an old curmudgeon about it. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, I, well, Facebook always looked dangerous to me. I have to say, Twitter looks interesting to me, but I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I get up in the morning and think I'm going to try Twitter today, and then a million other things happen, and the day is over, and I haven't yeah. tweeted a thing or anything. So, <laughs> but I do have a website which I barely keep up current as well. I think it's called Stuart Firestein. Dot org. Okay. I hope you can get to me through Columbia University. There are a variety of links. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll, then, I'll link to your books as well. Okay. Uh, that's a good idea. Yeah. I'll do that. Um, yeah. And if you ever want to post anything to social media, just email me and I'll post it for you. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. That's what I need. Yeah. And I'll just, I have these cute little like, you know, quote boxes and I'll just quote you. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's what I need. Good. Oh, you may. <laughs> You may have asked for trouble here, but okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's in my early days. So I'm, you know, All I'm right. not too high and mighty yet. Um, okay. So uh, with, with that, uh, we'll say yes. bye. Um, I'll, I'll link to Stuart's books in the, in the show notes. And uh, of course you can find me, Stephanie Ruber at Instagram and Facebook. I am on all the social media. Okay, cool. <laughs> and um yeah, thank thank you everybody for for listening and, and putting up with us today, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. So um, it's certainly been a pleasure you. for me. Yeah, take I care. Think of a better way to have spent an hour. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. <laughs>